Okay. Thanks everybody for being here. I want to thank all my colleagues for uh, for being here. If you go back home, in my state, what people are talking about is they're still talking about inflation, and they're talking about they want a, uh, a border to be secure right now. Uh, they those two issues still are the most important issues that people talk about. So all of us have been talking about this border bill for months. The thing that shocked me in the beginning was when McConnell took off the table the fact that we would actually require a lawless Biden administration to secure the border. The only way we knew how to do that is to take – he wanted you – Biden wanted Ukraine aid, so we said – and this was uh, – Ron Johnson put a lot of effort into this. We would say we would have on a monthly allotment of money tied to the numbers of people coming across the border coming down. But it's shocking to me and a lot of other people that McConnell took that off the table. Why this fell apart is because – it's what's happened since I've been up here five years. Negotiations were done behind closed doors. People that care about this issue, everybody up here, we want a secure border. People care about the issue. We're left in the dark. Uh, we started getting into some ideas about, about the text, and it seems like most of that's all come true. So what do we want? We want a secure border, number one. We don't want to codify Biden's open-door policy. We don't want to hurt the next Republican uh, administration from their ability to secure the border, which is what Americans want. And we ought to try to figure out how to do something the House will actually pass. Because also the House has been left out. So uh, Mike Johnson was not part of this. So we received the text finally Sunday night with the plan, again, like whether it's the omnibus, whether it's the China bill or all these bills, we get the text at the last minute, we're supposed to vote on it very quickly. Uh, the only thing I can think of is when people don't tell you information, you generally don't think of positive things about it. So what's our plan to go forward? What we should do is sit down as a conference and say, what's important to us? And then as a conference, we say, if, if the Democrats want to pass a bill, these are the things that we have to have in there. We don't have to go through the amendment process. We ought to, as a group, come together and say, this is what we ought to do. Now, we're going down the same path with, re with regard to Ukraine. <clears throat> We've had two conference meetings in the last two weeks. One was on the border, one was on Ukraine. If you listen to conversations, not that it was the majority, but anything but conversations, one, people think we ought to pay for things. People question why, whether we should – some people think we should do nothing on Ukraine, but some people say, well, at least we shouldn't do humanitarian aid and we shouldn't pay for their government if we're not going to – we're going to borrow money and pay for it especially like things like their pension, right? And if we're going to do – if we're going to do lethal aid, let's know exactly what we're going to do. But we're in the same position. Part of the supplemental, we have – we have a Ukraine package that we've not been sold on it. We've not had a conversation. Somebody's coming and telling us, hey, this is why we're doing it. This is the plan. This is lethal weapons. This is exactly how, how we're going to make sure Ukraine win, okay, and, and, and Putin lose. So – and then, well, then, you, and then you look at this, I'm not going to do anything that gives money to Gaza. I'm not. Why, why? I mean, do you think in the Second World War we're sitting there giving money? I mean, we, would, did we feel sorry for people that were part, part of governments that were trying to kill Americans? Probably did. But we – they just – you know, you know, Hamas just went in and killed 1,200 um, Israelis and some Americans, and they still have American hostages. And – and, th and this bill is going to allow, allow the president to give money to Gazans, which is going to go to Hamas? This is crazy. We have got to figure out a way – we've got to figure out a way to start working together as a conference to do what we believe in. We would like a secure border. I think, I think whether – we would all like Ukraine to win and Russia to lose. We might have different views on how that should be done, but why don't we start coming together as a conference to get something done? Let me turn it over to Senator Mike Lee. It's a great scene in one of the epic movies of all time, uh, Monty Python on the Search for the Holy Grail. They devise a plan to send uh, what, for lack of a better word, we'll call a Trojan rabbit into the castle occupied by some Frenchmen. They want to take over the castle. The idea was that Lancelot and Galahad were going to be inside the rabbit, and they'd wait until nightfall and then get out and start fighting their way out. It would help them take the castle. Only they forgot to get into the rabbit 
and the rabbit went in alone. The rabbit was later weaponized against them. Launched by a catapult, maybe it was a trebuchet, I think it was a catapult, uh, used as a weapon against King Arthur and his men. I sometimes think about this metaphor when I think about this bill. We had a, a, a decent idea. It didn't even require stealth. Uh, just that we, we were going to get some of what we wanted into this law uh, in exchange, uh, many Republicans are reluctant to vote for more Ukraine aid, especially given that we've spent more on Ukraine military aid than any other nation, every nation combined. And in exchange, we'd get something out of it, too. It only it feels sort of as if we sent the rabbit in there without some of the core elements that were needed. And then that rabbit was weaponized against us. Um, one of the most unfortunate parts of it, one of the features that really should have been in there, Rick Scott mentioned it a moment ago, and I think it, it, we should have at least included uh, HR2 or its primary components, and perhaps most importantly, we should have included border security metrics so that Ukraine aid release would be linked to the achievement of certain sustained border security uh, benchmarks. Had we done that, I think we'd be in an altogether different position. So, in other words, this is not about a failed experiment that you can't link the two together. It's not about the fact that uh, oh, suddenly Americans just feel differently about border security and whether or not it can be tied to Ukraine aid. I don't think that's it. I think many, if not most, Republicans uh, could perhaps imagine a scenario in which they might vote for something that would actually secure the border. We could have done that. This bill just doesn't do it. There are a whole lot of loopholes in it. A uh, loophole through which you could drive a Mack truck, a 747, and an Airbus A380 uh, uh, simultaneously through them. And uh, that's concerning. It didn't have to be this way. This is one of the perils that we should walk it, watch out for in the future. When you allow someone to negotiate on behalf of the larger group, the Senate Republican Conference, and for whatever reason, those in charge of the negotiation and directly involved in them uh, didn't want to share details and text along the way, a gulf can develop between the negotiators and those on whose behalf they're negotiating, a gulf that's so wide that when it finally comes out, the reaction is not at all what either party wanted. Uh, that is a concern. Uh, my hope is that in the future we don't do things this way. I'll turn the podium over now to my colleague from Wisconsin, Ron Johnson. Thank you, Mike. And I, I have no analogy for you, no uh, um. – yeah, we got a chart. Um, the conclusion of this, and I think this is concluding, uh, I think this bill is dead, is unfortunate. Because I, every Republican I know serving in Congress wants to secure the border, and we had a real opportunity to do so. Uh, Democrats wanted funding for Ukraine. A lot of Republicans do as well. I think most of our fellow citizens want to help the freedom-loving people of Ukraine. But there are, there are issues involved in that. But we had an opportunity to use the President's desire for funding for Ukraine to actually secure the border. The challenge for Republicans in this process uh, was that Democrats actually want an open border. Certainly the President does. Most of the members, Democrat members of Congress want an open border. And they caused this process. Uh, I've been saying for, for quite some time now that uh, Negotiating with them on this issue is like negotiating with an arsonist to put out the fire that arsonist set. So what we should have done is we should have, first of all, had trust in the American public who, by and large, agree with us. They recognize the open border is a clear and present danger to America, to its citizens, and they want to secure the border. So we should have had faith in them. We should have had a very open process. And I would suggest what we should have started with is somewhat like Speaker Johnson has started, is he lays out all the authority that the President currently has to secure the border. The Supreme Court ruled on the Immigration and Naturalization Act that it exudes deference to the executive. Um, then we could have pointed to well, different areas of different court decisions that have weakened that authority, and we could have corrected those. The Republicans would have happily given the President Biden the authority that he now says he wants. I don't believe him. But we would have been happy to give him that authority to actually secure the border because that's what we want. 
The problem with this bill, and it's kind of demonstrated in this, in this chart here, is it codifies an awful lot that we don't want. It normalizes thousands of people a day. It probably undermines a future president's ability to secure the border by having things like a, a discretionary threshold of 4,000. Well, what if you have a president in the future that wants to secure the border before it reaches 4,000? Have you undermined that president's ability? The, the fact that that, that, dis, that discretion to close the border ends after three years could also be used by liberal groups against a conservative president who wants to secure the border by saying, well, you thought you had that authority under the INA, but Congress didn't think you had it, so they passed this bill and they only gave a president that authority for three years. So the real tragedy of this process is that what the American people want, they're not going to get. And there's no, there was no reason for it. And the bill that was produced, and, and I think we all have a great deal of appreciation and sympathy for James Langford, who is knowledgeable about this, worked his tail off. But he was just facing that insurmountable hurdle of dealing with and negotiating with people that want an open border. It didn't work. Because that bill, in the end, would have probably done more harm than good by normalizing a flow of illegal immigration and undermining a future president who actually wants to secure the border. Uh, quick shifting to Ukraine. Uh, I agree with my colleagues who are complaining about the process internally in our conference. You know, as a conference, leadership needs to listen to its members. You know, in this case, had leadership listened to us and, and insisted on tying Ukraine funding to meeting thresholds, we might have had a bill we could support. Right now, I think Republicans, as you heard Senator Scott say, our, our constituents are concerned about inflation, which is caused by too much deficit spending. Uh, we spend well north of $870, $80 billion a year in defense a year. Um, now we want to spend another $110 billion. At a minimum, we should pay for it. There, there, there's got to be some dollars, for example, in all the green energy boondoggle spending that we can rescind to pay for security for Ukraine and Israel and Taiwan. So the principal position of the Republican conference here in the Senate should be, you know, we, we may or may not support funding for Ukraine, but if it's going to be given, it ought to at a minimum be paid for because we have to stop mortgaging our children's future. Now turn it over to Senator Cruz. Every once in a while, we have some good news. The good news is this bill is dead. Now, my views on this bill have not been ambiguous. At the last press conference we had here, I described it as, quote, a steaming pile of crap. Some people afterwards criticized that characterization. Can't imagine why. And they said, well, you haven't read the text. So how can you say that? And you're right. All I knew was what had been described by the bill sponsors. Well, now we've seen the text, and it turned out my assessment was far too kind. This bill is a terrible bill. I'm going to break it down on two, two metrics, number one, policy, and number two, politics. On policy, why is this bill a terrible bill? Because it does not solve the problem. We have the worst rate of illegal immigration in our nation's history. People are dying. Children are being brutalized. Women are being sexually assaulted. Over 100,000 people died of overdoses last year. This bill doesn't fix it. Understand, this border crisis is deliberate. Joe Biden caused it. He caused it by his own unilateral decisions. Three decisions caused this crisis, all made the first week of his presidency. He inherited the lowest rate of illegal immigration in 45 years, and his first week in pres as president, he halted construction on the border wall, he reinstated the disastrous policy of catch and release, and he pulled out of the unbelievably successful Remain in Mexico agreement. That caused this explosion. It also means Joe Biden could solve it tomorrow. How would he solve it tomorrow? By reversing those three decisions and you would get, once again, a secure border. 
Joe Biden doesn't want to secure the border. Kamala Harris doesn't want to secure the border. Chuck Schumer doesn't want to secure the border. And this bill was designed not to secure the border. Instead, this bill codified Joe Biden's open borders. This bill codified catch and release. Catch and release is contrary to law. But if we'd have passed this bill, catch and release would be right there in the U.S. Code. This bill normalized 5,000 illegal immigrants a day. 5,000 illegal immigrants a day works out to roughly 1.8 million a year. We've seen 9.6 million illegal immigrants under Joe Biden. Apparently, the Republican position was going to be, we don't like your 9.6, but we're okay with two-thirds of that illegal immigration. That was ridiculous. This bill gave work per permits to illegal immigrants. This bill gave government-funded lawyers to illegal immigrants. You know, one of the provisions that I personally find most noxious, this bill goes directly after the state of Texas. And it says, all litigation about immigration, you can't sue in Texas anymore. you got to come to Washington, D.C., to one of the most liberal courts in the country. Texas, sorry, we're throwing you out of court in Texas. You've got to come to D.C. As I observed on X last night, once sane Republican would side with Joe Biden over the state of Texas in this battle to secure the border. That's what this bill did. So as a policy matter, it was terrible policy. And as a matter of politics, it was even dumber. It was obvious from day one this bill would never pass into law. Speaker of the House said it was dead on arrival. House leadership all said it has zero chance of passage. So if it wasn't going to pass into law, if you knew that, and we did know that, what was the purpose of it? The entire purpose of this bill is to give political camouflage for Democrats running in November. The objective of this bill was, number one, to do nothing, so to, to do zero to, to, to secure the border, but to let every Democrat running for office say, gosh, I wanted to secure the border. But those mean Republicans wouldn't let us. This is all about talking points to deceive the voters. We're already seeing Democrat candidates across the country repeating that. I was ready to secure the border, but the Republicans didn't. It's an utter lie. Remember again, Joe Biden can secure the border any day he wants. He doesn't want to. And by the way, we could have passed legislation that every one of us would have supported. H.R. 2 that passed the House of Representatives. I've introduced H.R. 2 in the Senate. Chuck Schumer wants a bill that I'll vote for Ukraine aid on it. Give me Ukraine aid and H.R. 2 and I'll vote for that. Because that actually would secure the border. And what did Chuck Schumer say at the outset? Nope. H.R. 2 is off the table. Why? because the Democrats do not want to secure the border. They want this invasion, and the Americans who are dying as a result, they're willing to look the other way. Leaders set priorities. Leaders set goals. I never negotiate with people that don't share the same goals that I have, that the people I represent have if you will. My goal, my priority through all this has been to secure the border. President Biden's goal, his priorities all along, are to fund Ukraine. This bill should really be called the Ukraine Funding Bill. And yes, Joe Biden's been going through this charade now for several months, but he was never serious about securing the border. Like my colleague said, Joe Biden could secure the border yesterday. That was never his goal. Joe Biden's goals are to fund Ukraine, to not fund Israel. He wants to fund Hamas. I think it's all very obvious what his goals are. Now he doesn't want to do anything that might hurt Iran's feelings. That's Joe Biden's goals. Why? Because they're trying to salvage his horrible national security policies. Look, there, are, there is legislation that we would support. We would, we would support a bill that actually secured the border. And though whatever folks are going to hear today on their social media, on their news, the good news is that Americans figured this out already. They understand that Joe Biden could secure the border yesterday. And that ultimately, 
Come November, the American public gets to decide who is going to secure our border. Under Joe Biden, 10 million people cross the border illegally. President Trump averaged less than 1,000 people per day. That's why come November, we're going to have a new sheriff in town who's going to secure the border. Thank you. I, I don't need to stand up here for too long. I echo the comments uh, made by my colleagues and friends up here. But one of the things that I've heard from a number of reporters and from a number of Democratic activists is this argument that why don't you guys not let the perfect be the enemy of the good? And, of course, the presumption here is that this is good border policy. It's not good border policy. We're letting the bad be the enemy of the good because this is bad border policy. If you're going to actually vote to enact border policy, you're going to take a tough vote. For all the reasons that Ted stated, it ought to actually do something important. We have to remember the fundamental framing here. This is what so much of the reporting ignores about this border crisis. The fundamental framing here is Joe Biden has every tool at his disposal to end the border crisis tomorrow. So what we're trying to do with this law is constrain his discretion and force him to do the job that he refuses to do. We're trying to force the president to do what he already could do under existing legal authority. And yet every single provision of this legislation, or nearly every provision of this legislation, allows either Secretary Mayorkas or the President of the United States to waive the enforcement mechanisms. How, how do you square these things? How do you say we've got to force the president to do a job, and yet we're passing a border bill that allows the president to waive every single authority that the bill gives him? We do not need to give Joe Biden more tools. We do not need to give Joe Biden a border security bill, which is really, as Marshall, Roger Marshall said, a Ukraine first bill masquerading as a border security bill. What we need to do is pass legislation that forces Joe Biden to do his job restrains his discretion, constrains his discretion, not give him more authority to run into around the laws that we have in this country. This bill doesn't do that, so we can't support it. As you heard everybody said, that doesn't mean there is an immigration law that we would support. There are a number of provisions in this bill that if they were made better and actually forced Joe Biden to do his job, we'd all vote for it. I'm maybe the biggest skeptic of Ukraine aid in the United States Senate, I care much more about the American southern border, but I'm not going to vote for a border security package that doesn't do any border security. Thanks. Uh, since Mike Lee gave a movie reference, I'll have my own. Um, this whole episode reminds me of that scene from The First Vacation where Chevy Chase goes to buy his car and Eugene Levy comes out and uh, it's not the car he ordered. He brings out the metallic pea green family truckster. And Chevy Chase is like, this is not the car. And Eugene Levy says, you think you hate it now, but wait till you drive it. So when you <laughs> saw the language, this is what we were warning about. The language is actually worse than anybody could have possibly imagined. We thought it was going to be bad just because of the things that got leaked out. And for the reasons mentioned, normalizes thousands of people, illegal immigrants each day. Thousands normalizes that. Um, so you've got that dynamic happening. But the language, the two things I want to highlight, because you've heard a lot of this before. First of all, Joe Biden has every authority right now to secure the border. We don't need to do anything. We might support strong language to force him to do it. But he doesn't need anything to secure the border. He can do those three things that Ted mentioned, remain in Mexico, principally being one, finish the wall with the money that's already been appropriated, and stop abusing parole. He's illegally paroling millions of people here by category, which is illegal under existing law. But if you were – the two biggest issues with this bill, if you were a open borders think tank and tried to come up with two clever ways to get around whatever it is that they're trying to do in this bill, you would do two things. One is you would remove the courts from the asylum process, which is what they're doing here. They have these asylum agents that are true believers in open borders – approving citizenship essentially at the border. That will only be a magnet for the cartels telling these folks what to say when they get there. The second piece is any way to you know, actually force Joe Biden to enforce the law will be removed because Texas can't even do it in their home jurisdiction. They have to come to the D.C. circuit, which has been mentioned as a liberal circuit. So if you did those two things, this is a win for you if you're an open borders crowd. They got those two things in this bill. That's just two things. So this bill is a total disaster. It's dead. 
It's going to require 41 courageous senators to stand up and say, Chuck Schumer, we're not going to accept this. You've given two days on this disastrous language. No more. And it's sort of a word of warning about trying to, the next step, once this is dead, try to tie unrelated things together again. Hopefully people have learned their lesson. If you had a smart Israel bill on the floor, it would get 90-plus votes. But all roads lead through Ukraine here, I found out in this town. So tying all this stuff together again, we sort of see what this happens. Let's have the courage to actually debate these things individually. People can offer amendments. We don't money, want money going uh, to Hamas. We've already pointed those objections. But when you start lumping this stuff together, uh, it creates real problems. And that has played out dramatically in this cataclysmically bad bill that hopefully we'll reject tomorrow. You know, you can – we'll take questions. But you can see this with uh, Chris Murphy's – See this with Chris Murphy's uh, tweet. A requirement the president to funnel asylum claims in land ports of entry when more than 5,000 people cross the day. The border never closes. It's, they said it. Senator, yes. Senator uh, can I ask a question of Senator Cruz? Because yep. you are a border state senator, obviously. The National Border Patrol Council endorsed your reelection in 2018. They're obviously very critical of the Biden administration's handling of the border. They came out with a statement yesterday endorsing this bill. A part of their statement said, while not perfect, the Border Act of 2024 is a step in the right direction and is far better than this current status quo. What's your response to that? I don't know why they did that. I'm big fans of them, but uh, they're mistaken in that. And what I'll tell you, no one in my conference, I stood up at lunch and I asked the people negotiating this. I said, what's your strategy to pass this in the House? The Speaker of the House has said it's dead on arrival. Do you have any strategy to pass it on the House? And if you don't, why are you doing this? Why are you behaving like Chuck Schumer's political team? This was always a stupid idea. And the reason it was a stupid idea is because our leadership was not actually seeking to secure the border. That was not the objective, because Chuck Schumer was not willing to secure the border. Why is this bill so bad? Look. Chris Murphy was very candid. You know, they say in Washington, a gaffe is when a politician accidentally tells the truth. Well, there you go. Chris Murphy, the border never closes. The Democrats' opening position was we will not secure the border. And the reason this bill got so bad is Republican leadership wanted a Ukraine bill so bad they just said give the Democrats what they want so we can get Ukraine funding even if it doesn't solve the problem. I think it is disastrous to put into law Joe Biden's open borders. I think it is disastrous to put into law catch and release. And I think it is disastrous for Republicans to claim falsely we're securing the border when they're voting for a bill that, as Chris Murphy admits, the border never closes. It keeps this invasion going in perpetuity. If this bill passed, the invasion that we are seeing never stops. Look, if you don't believe me, most reporters here are Democrats. If you don't believe me, believe the Democrat mayors and the Democrat governors who are telling you what's happening in their city. Eric Adams, liberal Democrat mayor in New York City, said illegal immigration is destroying New York City. That was 110,000 illegal immigrants. I don't disagree with him on that. But if 110,000 illegal immigrants are destroying New York City, what the hell do you think 9.6 million are doing to Texas and the rest of the southern border? And so I'm angry. I'm angry that the Democrats want this human suffering to continue. And I'm angry at our own Republican leadership for going along with it in a terrible bill. Our line should have been secure the border and we're with you. And if you won't, the answer is no. It was obvious this bill would end in failure, and yet, repeatedly, every one of us at lunch stood up repeatedly and said, this is where it's going to end. And yet, like a cowboy riding a nuclear bomb down, waving a flag. That was for you, Mike. <laughs> Mike left. Republican leadership would not listen to reason, and now we're in a colossal mess. Well, I want to answer the border bill question a little bit more from the heart. Uh, most of us have been to the border multiple times. 
The Border Patrol officers are desperate. My dad was a police officer. I know what it's like. They're, they're, going, they're drowning. They're going down for the third time. And maybe there was a little piece that could have helped them. But it's not enough to secure the border. At the end of the day, a small lifeline to Border Patrol, but it, but it doesn't really secure the border. Is it time for Mitch McConnell to go? I think it is. Everyone here also supported a leadership challenge to Mitch McConnell in November. Uh, I think a Republican leader should actually lead this conference and should advance the priorities of Republicans. I can tell you what I said when we had that leadership election in November of 2022. It was right after a very disappointing election. 2022, the wind was at our back. It should have been a phenomenal Republican election year. Republicans should have won the Senate. We should have won a big majority in the House. Instead, we lost a seat in the Senate, and we barely got a majority in the House. And, and I stood up and said, look, in any ordinary organization, when you f are faced with failure, if you're running a business and you lose $50 million, you don't just say, hey, everything's great, let's keep doing it. No, you sit down and say, what are we doing wrong? And at that meeting, I turned to Mitch McConnell then, and I said, look, we spent the last two years with a group a handful of Republicans joining with Democrats to pass the Democrat agenda. And I said, maybe, maybe that's a good idea. I, I don't think it is, but someone could make the argument that's a good idea. I'll tell you, it's one-sided. You know who doesn't do that? The Democrats. In 2017 and 2018, when we had a Republican president, Republican Senate, Republican House, not one single time did a group of Democrats join with the Re Republicans to pass the Republican agenda. So we're the only ones who do it. But I turned to Mitch then and I said, is there anything? What are we willing to fight on? What are you willing to fight on? Is there anything you're willing to draw a line in the sand and say, we will fight? And he refused to answer that question now. And that's why we're in this mess. Because this was a plan that was designed to lose. This is a plan Chuck Schumer is thrilled with, with which is why Schumer says, I got 98 problems, but Mitch isn't one of them. So, more urgently now because of the way that this we had we out. you know we had an election um, in November of 22 which was supposed to be in Jan January of uh, 23 they rushed it um, and we talked about what we wanted to do different we look we ought to come together and start talking about what we believe in and then fight for those things as a conference we're not doing that that's why that's why that we're we're in the position we're in you know they, they a few people negotiated this. McConnell decided we are not going to have something that forced a lawless administration to secure the border. Um, and so, I mean, this is where we are. And we're doing the exact same thing on Ukraine. Uh, so, regarding, regarding Ukraine, what is the future of, of the aid to Ukraine? And are you planning to bring it as a standalone bill? Well, first off, there are a lot of us have different views, but I think everybody would like Ukraine to win and Russia to lose. But we'd like to know, you know, I don't think a lot of us think we ought to be doing humanitarian aid. Uh, we ought to let Europe do that. I think a lot of us believe we shouldn't be borrowing money to run their government. But we would like to give them lethal aid. But, like, what is the plan? Do you realize in this bill, finally, the, the, the Biden administration has to give us their plan? Why wouldn't you, before you want to come ask us for money, tell us exactly what the plan is? If you listen to – we had a conference We had a conference meeting on this. People say we'd like – a lot of people said we'd like to get the pay paid for, uh, and we'd like to understand what the plan is. We don't have one. Senator, I have a question for Senator Vance, please. Sure. Uh, you were recently elected. You won a tough <coughs> primary to, to win the nomination. Do you think the Republican leadership here is out of touch with GOP voters on the border and on Ukraine, given that this was unveiled, hoping that it would get 25 Republican votes, and it's probably not going to get any Republican votes on Wednesday? Well, I want to echo everything that Ted has said, um, and, and I think all of us have made this argument that leadership really screwed this up. I think they made a series of political arguments that were never going to actually fly. They knew or should, at least should have known that this bill was ne never actually going to get there. And certainly on the Ukraine question, yes, I think leadership is massively out of touch with Republican voters. We are not, as a Republican Party, behind unlimited, unaccounted for aid to Ukraine without any goals in mind, without any sense of where the money is going and what's going to be accomplished if we continue to support Ukraine. So I absolutely think it's, it's, it's a failure of leadership that we've gotten to this point. And, yes, I think they're out of touch on that particular issue. There's one other point here, because uh, you've heard some, of, some folks in our leadership make this argument. 
that what happened here is Republicans as a conference demanded that we use Ukraine as leverage to get border concessions from the Biden administration. They'll say things like, well, you wanted us to negotiate for border security, and now that we have this package, you say that it's not good enough. Well, we asked you to negotiate for border security, not crappy border security that has nothing to do with securing the American southern border. So this idea that we signed a political like, death compact where we wanted to negotiate for border security, so we're therefore committed to, to, to supporting any package that comes out of these negotiations is ridiculous. If you had a bill that said we're going to legalize 12 million illegal aliens, every single Republican, I hope, would vote against it. But we're not committing ourselves to voting for this thing just because we entered the negotiation. And the idea that we are, the idea, and you hear this from some of our leadership, and hopefully they will stop, the idea that we committed to supporting whatever came out of this negotiation is pure, unadulterated bullshit. We supported a negotiation to bring common sense border security to this country. We did not agree to a border fig leaf to send another $61 billion to Ukraine. Hi, Casey Murray at Notice. Um, you've all had some pretty strong words today about the bill. Um, this question is for anyone, um, although I'll direct it at Senator Cruz. Um, fellow Texan. Um, so do you feel at this point that Langford has been left out to dry? You know, he went and negotiated and brought something and um, it's not met a great reception from fellow Republicans? Listen, James Langford is a good man. He's a good friend of all of us. We all like James. Uh, he is deeply principled. He's deeply honorable. Um, I think leadership sent him out on a kamikaze mission. And I think it was very cynical of Republican leadership to do that. Um, I think he did it in good faith, and they put him on the edge of a, a branch, and they saw the branch off. And that, unfortunately, is a pattern we see with Republican leadership here, and it's why there are rare, very re real concerns about our leadership. That was not, not the right way to handle this. And, and the problem was leadership's position was you must get to a deal. And understand, Schumer's position was, we will never secure the southern border. Now, those two statements, if they both are true, what is the only outcome that can come of that? We'll reach a deal that doesn't secure the border. That's what they did. And what leadership should have said is, we're going to secure the border. If you want a deal, agree to secure the border. And if not, we will walk away. And what leadership d did that was wrong is they were so desperate to a deal that they agreed to Chuck Schumer's open borders. I, I want to stick up for my friend James Langford here. James Langford did the very best job he could do with the cards he was dealt. I don't think that James is, is really pleased with this bill either. There's lots of things, but pretty much everything I've asked him about, he said, I tried, but we couldn't get across the finish line. Look, the American people gave the Democrats the White House, they gave him control of the Senate and a very slim majority in the House. So we're negotiating a bill that looks just like this. It ends up just where you would think it would be. It shades what the Democrats wanted. I really don't think Henry Kissinger could have negotiated a better deal with the cards that he was dealt. This is not on the back of James Langford. His goal to secure the border is as genuine as anybody else up here. But this bill is the best he could do. I'm not going to speak for James, but I think his hope was that we could take this bill and amend it and make it better. But I'm afraid it's not close enough to, to uh, do anything but stop the life support and pronounce it dead. Let me just quick chime in on here. The problem with this is it was an opaque process. It was secret. How do you take an issue that what – percentage of the American public agree. You know, 90 plus believe we do, do need a secure border, that the open border is a clear and present danger to America, to them. H how do you take that and screw it up? Well, you, you do it by not being transparent. You do it by not trusting the American public. And, and that is a result from the get-go. When McConnell entered into this secret negotiation with Schumer, uh, it was fatally flawed. Nobody knew what was in it. Uh, what was being leaked looked bad enough. But we weren't trying to win the argument in the court of public opinion. People would have supported what we want to do here. 
I said repeatedly, and again, it galls me to hear, you know, people talk about that, you know, we're trying to take some political advantage. Early on in the negotiation, I said we'd be doing Joe Biden an enormous political favor, favor if we forced him to secure the border. I was more than willing to do that because I want to secure the border, as all of us do. But when you do it in a secret negotiation, when you, without consulting the conference, take off the table probably our biggest point of leverage, which is tie Ukraine funding to metrics that the president has to meet. Again, we're dealing with a lawless president who ignores Supreme Court rulings, who has lied repeatedly to the American public. How do you force that executive who wants an open border to actually abide by any agreement? Well, you got to tie it to what he wants. That was taken off the table, and it was secret. And so this just blew up in Leader McConnell's face, and now he's trying to blame President Trump who, to the best of my knowledge, I haven't talked to him. I'm not sure anybody on the stage has talked to him. We wanted to secure the border. That is why we are voting no. This does more harm than good. And that's not James Langford's fault. That's Leader McConnell's fault. I just want to add one point on this, because what Ron said is very important. When you go into a border security negotiation, as complicated as immigration law is, and you make it entirely secret, that gives a massive asymmetric advantage to the team that has more lawyers. So on the one hand, you have the Democratic majority, you have the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Justice, you have the army of lawyers that they have, and on the other hand is James Lankford and his staff negotiating in secret. The idea that any person could negotiate successfully to a border security package that wouldn't have multiple loopholes in it is crazy. These guys have a massive advantage. It was a huge mistake. I don't know who in leadership made this decision. But if it had been out in the open, okay, we have a number of good immigration groups. We have a number of good advocacy organizations that could have helped us level the playing field. The fact that it was done in secret, I think, was by design, and it was done to sabotage real border security. Can you say a few words in Spanish and also your reaction to the statement of the Border Patrol Union? Yeah. The... Um, La frontera sur sigue completamente colapsada. Gracias a las políticas radicales de Joe Biden y su plan de uh, uh, fronteras abiertas. Uh, este acuerdo de Biden, Schumer, McConnell no asegura la frontera. Si Biden hubiese asegurado la frontera, fortalecido el sistema de inmigración y se hubiese mantenido firme contra los dictadores de la región, si ese acuerdo is, would be, would, 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 uh, está correcto. Pero, you know, Joe Biden no tiene un plan para cerrar la frontera. Um, and with, regard, uh, with regard to the Border Patrol agents, I have a good relationship, uh, like I think all of us do. You respect them. I know they're working hard. I think, I think they would like to, they would appreciate any support they can to try to secure the border. Any of us, we've all been down there. They're working their butts off. And this is, I mean, this is, you know, this is, they will, they'll take anything to try to do better, better job. But, this, we, we have an obligation to secure the border. This doesn't do it. Yes. Hi, Senator. I'm interested in hearing more about what happened at this GOP conference meeting. You know, I'm trying to clarify for our viewers at Newsmax. Is McConnell urging you all to vote no on this procedural vote? And what does that say about leadership? If so, that you hear about this bill, there's all this, like, hubbub for it, and then a couple days later, vote no on it. Well, um, you know, he recommended we vote no. Um, I, mean, I think, I think first off, everybody saw that that's what that was going to happen. I don't know what you, you can ask him why he made the decision to vote no, but we're going to have to go. We're going to have to change the way this place works. I'm a business guy. If I ask somebody to go negotiate a deal for me, if they didn't keep me informed, they're they're taking a big risk that the deal would not happen. That's exactly what happened here. We 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 had meetings. You know, a lot of us forced us uh, conference meetings. We told our position both on the border and both our Ukraine, and then decisions were made completely without us. So I don't know if anybody else wants to talk about what happened yesterday. Well, I will say at least McConnell in the end recognized reality. But, but I do want to underscore the fact that, uh, you know, we need a different governing model for our conference. I mean, this, this one person making all the decisions, keeping everything close to the vest, it's, it's obviously failing. It's not working. And so, you know, what, what we need, and I made this point, Repeatedly, we're like the board of directors. We've chosen a negotiator. That board of directors has to, has to be informed of what's happening. That's what uh, Senator Scott's talking about, and that didn't happen. And so it's really no surprise, based on then what 
the result was because Democrats want an open border. I have to keep stressing that. This is Biden's fault and the Democrats' fault. They want an open border. It's impossible to do a deal with them. But we, need, we have to, if you're doing a negotiation, Senator Scott knows this, you have to be willing to walk away. And unfortunately, McConnell was never willing to walk away. He just wanted the Ukraine funding, and so we end up with this debacle. I don't know how else you can really refer to this. We had an opportunity, we had an opportunity to secure the border, which is, I think, Republicans' top priority, and we blew it. So, so yeah, we're, we're not real happy with what happened here on the border. But I think that's probably about it, huh? Uh, so you said that um, you all wanted uh, Ukraine to win. <clears throat> but as we speak, Russia is, getting, is gaining advantage on the battlefield because of the shortage of ammunition that Ukraine is ex experiencing. So <clears throat> are you willing to take responsibility for what happened if this continues this stalemate um, in the Senate and, the, and Congress and Putin wins? Um, and also, you um, say that you don't know the, what the strategy is, but the administration is saying that the strategy is basically to um, help Ukraine win, to put, help put it in a um, better position uh, when an uh, occasion for negotiations arises. Is, is that not sufficient? We would, we'd like for Ukraine to win. We want Russia to lose. Okay, we, we, okay I can tell you, I, I, I'm on armed services, okay? You can't, you can't. I don't know exactly what the strategy is the Biden administration has. I don't know why they're not giving them weapons. I don't know why they were so slow giving them weapons. So, I mean, I'd like to know that stuff. So finally in this bill, they have an obligation to do that. Why hasn't it been happened for the last two years? So absolutely I want them to win, and I'll do everything I can to make sure they win. Senators, I know uh, you just said that, you know, there isn't a governing model that represents you guys, that, you know, the Republican people are not reflected by leadership. I wonder – is there any plan that you're putting into motion, anything you can do about it at this point? Well, there will be an election uh, again, um, you know, after uh, the November election. Um, you know, we I, – like I, I ran. I put out my plan on what we should do, of how we ought to, how we ought to operate. Uh, I hope a lot of people talk about how this place ought to operate, and I hope we have a robust – uh, discussion about how we ought to, how to operate. Because if we want to get the border secure, if we want to help Ukraine, if we want to help Israel, that's what it's going to take. Thanks, Thanks everybody. You.